Greetings, folks. We're going to have a look at a sad, tragic, and shocking story involving the murder of two young teenage boys who were killed in Saline County, Arkansas, and their bodies placed on the railroad tracks in an effort to conceal their murders. We're also going to look a little bit into the cover-up of those murders and a few others. For 29 years, justice has been denied to the Ives and Henry families for the murders of their sons, Kevin and Don. On August 23, 1987, Kevin, then 17, and Don, then 16, were out at night hunting and sadly would be murdered and their bodies placed on the train tracks where a Union Pacific train would eventually run them over hours later at approximately 4.25 a.m. Their case would eventually gain national attention in news articles across the country, including the LA Times and the Wall Street Journal, among others, as well as at the time the nationally syndicated television show Unsolved Mysteries, which aired two episodes to their case. Another outlet to focus on the murders would be the world's books, with the best probably being Meryl Everett's Boys on the Tracks, documenting the case of Kevin and Don's murders in the cover-up in extreme detail. The investigation was bungled right from the get-go, and eventually officials from all three levels of federal, state, and local governments have all played a part over the decades in the cover-up of the murders of Kevin and Don. It's known who was involved in the murders. There were witnesses to the events that night on record that have passed polygraphs. There's even a confession letter from one of the participants to the murders. So what's the problem? Why can't the Ives and Henry families not get justice for the murders of their sons, Kevin and Don? The probable reason there has been no justice for Kevin and Don's murders is because of why they were murdered. Answering that question leads to even more crimes, crimes committed by government agencies. Kevin and Don were killed because they had stumbled onto a drug drop that hot summer night on the very same train tracks where their bodies would be later placed. We have multiple witness testimony to that. That drug drop was part of a secret operation first being run by the late infamous cocaine smuggler Barry Seal and was one of the facets of the Iran-Contra operations that was never revealed to the American public. It's likely the why the cover-up of Kevin and Don's murders happened, and it began immediately into the investigation and would continue throughout the years resulting in 10 different local, state and federal investigations, grand juries, etc., all bearing down on different locations in Arkansas including Saline and surrounding counties and the MENA airport as well, all being shut down before any final word would be allowed into the public record. For Kevin and Don, we're going to look at what we do have in the way of evidence and show who we do know was involved in their murders. Hints that a cover-up started immediately in the investigation after their bodies were found. Despite the evidence to the contrary, local officials were immediately treating the case as an accident, while at the same time concealing or denying evidence such as a green tarp that the boys' bodies were covered with or the rifle that they had with them at the time. The investigation was so shoddy that they even left behind Kevin's foot on the train tracks, which wasn't discovered until two days later. Despite all the bungling right off the bat, Saline County Sheriff Jim Steed would proclaim he was pleased with a thorough investigation after those same two days. Let's meet Fami Malik. He was the state medical examiner in Arkansas at the time of the boys' murders and did the autopsy. After the autopsy, Malik ruled that Kevin and Don had smoked 20 pot joints and fell asleep on the tracks, and thus didn't hear the train blowing its whistle as it was bearing down on them. Now anybody who knows anything about smoking pot knows that's just a ridiculous ruling. Of course, the Ives and Henry families fought that ruling, and a grand jury was formed, and a second autopsy was ordered. Enter pathologist Joseph Burton of Atlanta, who was brought in and would find that Kevin had been beaten in the head with the butt end of a rifle, and Don had been stabbed in the back both prior to being placed on the tracks, which would explain the thickness of their blood at the time of their deaths, as witnessed by the train's engineers and emergency first responders to the scene. This clip from the movie Obstruction of Justice better explains the Fami Malik story and more of its controversial rulings. 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry were struck by a train near Alexander. The medical examiner has said that the boys were asleep and drugged with marijuana. The parents, however, disputed that claim and persuaded authorities to reopen the case. Because of their persistence, Kevin and Don's bodies were exhumed. New autopsies were performed and a grand jury was convened. Dr. Joseph Burton, a nationally recognized forensic pathologist from out of state, performed the new autopsies. His findings revealed that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' face had been smashed by a blow from a rifle butt before their bodies were placed on the railroad tracks. This information alone would strongly suggest that the boys were injured, uh, rendered unconscious, or even killed prior to their bodies being run over by the train. Burton's autopsies also revealed that Malik had mutilated Kevin's skull by sawing it in so many different directions that it was impossible to tell where the original skull fractures were. 
Malik also had completely dismantled Kevin's jawbones. Burton stated he had performed thousands of autopsies and had never seen anything like it. Was Malik trying to hide something? Was there a step? The answer is no, they were not stabbed. Were they dead beforehand? Absolutely no, they were alive. A former employee at the crime lab has said he discovered what appeared to be evidence of a stab wound during the original autopsy, but was told, quote, not to worry about it. Malik has refused all comment. The deaths of these two boys uh, most probably were not accidental deaths, but that they met their death as a result of injuries inflicted on them by other uh, people or another person. In addition to Burton, two other forensic pathologists and seven forensic investigators with more than 100 years accumulated experience investigating homicides reviewed the case. It was their collective opinion that the ruling be changed to murder. During the midst of all of um, the turmoil uh, with trying to get the ruling changed in our case, it became very apparent that uh, this was not an isolated instance of an error in the ruling on the manner of death. Uh, there were many other cases statewide that um, we became aware of. In 1992, the Los Angeles Times tallied more than 20 additional cases where Dr. Malik had falsified evidence and ruled incorrectly. One case involved the murder of Raymond Albright, who had been shot five times in the chest with a Colt 45. Incredibly, Malik had ruled suicide. Another involved James Dewey Milam, whose body was found without the head. In this case, Malik ruled the cause of death to be an ulcer. Although Milam's head had been clearly severed with a knife, Malik claimed the family pooch had bitten off the head, eaten the entire thing and then regurgitated. Malik says he tested the dog's vomit and found traces of Milam's brain and skull. Unfortunately for Dr. Malik, Milam's head was later found. Malik, it turns out, had made up the entire story. Media coverage of Malik's dishonest rulings resulted in a massive public outcry calling for his removal from office. The medical examiner comes up and he has fabrication to where he has, has, has created his own evidence. This is of a magnitude that could create a national scandal, and if necessary, it will. I have work to do. Dr. you're a zombie. I have work to do. Excuse yes, me, please. Yes, it's you. It's you uh, can say that like you are a hundred Dr. Malcolm. Lying on his autopsy cases, lying in court, and he's not an honest person. And he should be prosecuted. He should be prosecuted. Nevertheless, both Governor Clinton and the Arkansas State Medical Examiner Commission Chairman, Jocelyn Elders, who had the power to remove Malik from office, not only insisted he remain, they gave him a raise. Based on the facts I have, I really feel that Arkansas owes Dr. Malik a great debt and a real apology. Today, the governor was asked if Malik should resign. I don't think that's a decision that I should make based on what I now know. How about that? Jocelyn Alders says the state of Arkansas owes Malik a great debt and a real apology. She must have been on crack, sold to her by her son. More on that in a moment, but seriously. And Bill Clinton follows that up when asked about if Malik should resign with a great response. I don't think that's a decision that I should make based on what I now know. Are you kidding me? Malik should have been indicted and sent to prison. Anyways, let's meet Linda Ives, Kevin's mother, and hear what she has to say about Fami Malik's ruling. We were absolutely puzzled and outraged over the ruling uh, of accidental as a manner of death. Uh, we didn't think that the facts supported that ruling. Uh, and what we started out to do was just to obtain a second opinion. Uh, we met resistance from all fronts, from law enforcement, from the crime lab. Uh, we retained an attorney and a private investigator and obtained court orders to get um, testable samples of everything that they had in order to get a second opinion. And Femi Malik refused to obey the court orders. It didn't matter what Malik did, whether it was uh, perjure himself in court, fabricate evidence in murder trials, called coroners, murderers. Uh, Clinton defended him by uh, excusing it as being stressed out, uh, overworked, and underpaid. Uh, his testimony 
compromised evidence in a lot of felony cases in Arkansas. And uh, it was very transparent that uh, the end result was that he was given a $14,000 raise. It was an absolute insult to my family. Read my lips. I'm not going to command. Dr. Malik refused repeated requests to talk with us, but when we caught up with him, he said people didn't like him because he's from Egypt, and he claimed he had never made a single mistake in any of the 7,000 autopsies he conducted. People say that as the state medical examiner, you were incompetent and you bungled cases, and that Governor Clinton, for some reason, defended you and protected you. Is, is that the case? Uh, you have to understand. I did 7,000 autopsies. Not one single case overturned because of me. Not a single case? Not one single case. But that's just not true. Yet somehow, Malik got a 41% raise for his efforts. Hmm. On a side note, I'd like to take the time to point out the differences in motherhood. On one hand, we have Linda Ives, who lost her son. And she has the proper mother's love of her child, which has also been what's kept her drive in full gear to continue the fight for justice for her son, Kevin. On the other hand, we have Arkansas State Medical Examiner's Commission Chairman, Jocelyn Elders, Sammy Malik's boss, pictured here, who no doubt loves her son, but one must question her overall ethics in supporting Malik. And in an ironic twist, and if you know the overall case well enough, you'll agree it's ironic. Shortly after Bill Clinton, who strongly supported Malik as well, took elders to the White House with him and appointed elders United States Surgeon General, her son Kevin will get arrested for selling cocaine to undercover agents and get a 10-year jail sentence. Had elders been paying more attention to truth and integrity, perhaps she would not only have told the truth about Malik, but might have raised her son in a better manner that would have had him knowing better than to involve cocaine into his life and selling it. Anyways, let's meet Dan Harmon. Dan Harmon is the key player in this whole story. Keep that in mind as we go. He was a former state prosecutor from 1978 to 1980 and had his share of troubles and unreported domestic abuses on multiple ex-wives over the years and was always protected and vouched for by many officials, both law enforcement and civil. And by the time Fami Malik had made his ridiculous ruling, Harmon actually convinced Judge John Cole to appoint himself, Harmon, as special prosecutor in the original grand jury investigation into the boys' murders. Harmon and his best friend and assistant prosecutor Richard Garrett approached the Ives family and embraced them as friends promised them they would find the killers of Kevin and Don. Little did the Ives family know at the time, though, that Dan Harmon himself was actually involved in the murders of Kevin and Don, which in hindsight now makes sense, understanding why Harmon made sure he was appointed to the case. Ultimately, the grand jury of investigation into Kevin and Don's murders was closed down on December 31, 1988, by Judge Cole, working in concert with Harmon and Garrett, and the jurors are not allowed to render any of its findings on record. The Saline County Special Grand Jury has now disbanded. Three hours ago, it delivered its final report on the deaths of two teenage boys. But the grand jury was not allowed to do what it wanted. I know that because you could not repeat in the report much of the testimony that you heard and evidence that you received, that you are somewhat frustrated by it. And that's understandable. In the final analysis, I know that the grand jury hated to, at this point to give it up because I think the public needs to know about the uh, seriousness of the drug problem here in Saline County and maybe other surrounding counties. So even though there was no one charged in the original grand jury investigation, and there was plenty of evidence of many problems and suspicious activity by officials overall, Judge John Cole and prosecutors Dan Harmon and Richard Garrett brought the grand jury to a close on December 31, 1988, with the grand jury evidence and reports suppressed and not allowed on record against the grand jury's own wishes. Unreal. And the unreal is only just beginning. A number of witnesses and people with information to Kevin and Don's murders would themselves be killed in the years following the murders of Kevin and Don. All of their murders would go unresolved as well, except for the murder of Keith McCaskill, who they pinned on one of his neighbors who couldn't possibly have done it. McCaskill also reportedly announced to his friends and family in the final days before his own murder that he knew too much about the murders of Kevin and Don and his days were numbered as well. Coney was a friend of Kevin and Don's and was actually with Kevin and Don in the night they were murdered. It would likely be the last friendly face the poor boys would ever get to see again. It's also interesting to note that both Keith McCaskill and Keith Coney were themselves both killed with their murders unresolved before Judge Cole, Harmon, and Garrett shut down the original grand jury investigation with no public results permitted from the jury. 
Another interesting thing to note was that during those investigations, despite what witnesses such as the parents had told officials, they still refused to link the murders of their deaths to Kevin and Don, despite the obvious connections. I think that Mr. McCaskill was probably suffering from a lot of paranoia. And right now the indications are that nobody else was involved. Might there have been a reason, though, for his paranoia? I'm sure there was a reason for his paranoia. Uh, because he had talked to the police or the prosecutor? I don't know that that would be the reason. What about uh, the murder? Is it connected at all with the uh, grand jury investigation? Not that we know of. McCaskill was a witness in the Bryant train deaths investigation. Although police haven't ascertained a motive for the murder, they say there's no connection. This investigation to the death of Don Henry or Kevin Ives, and I don't foresee anything in, in uh, the pursuance of the rest of this investigation that would be uh, anything that would uh, make me change my mind. Now let's meet Jean Duffy. She's one of the few honest people in this whole sordid affair. In the beginning of 1990, Jean Duffy was appointed to head the newly created 7th Judicial District Drug Task Force that was formed to look into the drug and corruption problems going on in the Saline County area and other surrounding counties as well. There was also a federal investigation looking into Saline and surrounding counties for drugs and corruptions amongst officials being run at the same time by U.S. Attorneys Chuck Banks and his assistant Bob Govar. The deeper Duffy and her team of investigators got, the more Dan Harmon through the media was trying to discredit her. Though she had no way to know it at the time, but immediately on Duffy's first day on the job as head of the task force, she was told not to look into anything involving government officials by her immediate supervisor, Gary Arnold. Gary Arnold came into my office, stood in front of my desk, looked me straight in the face and said, Jean, you are not to use the drug task force to investigate any public official. He turned on his heel and marched out. Now, as startling as that statement might sound, I really didn't think that it was going to pose any kind of problem because at that time, I didn't have any indication that there was any public official in our judicial district who was involved in drugs. Let's have a look at some of what Jean Duffy discovered. I established a drug task force uh, and set it up, hired undercover officers, learned what I could to uh, help the district get on its feet with uh, investigation of drug activities in the district. Instantly, one of her investigators reveals that the now infamous train deaths may be tied to a major drug smuggling ring operating out of MENA. There were people who had been turning up dead who were possible witnesses in the train deaths case. I respected my undercover officer's instincts about the case and I certainly gave him permission to go forward with an investigation. He said that there were drug drops coming from airplanes in that area, in the exact vicinity where Kevin and Don had been murdered. And these uh, drug drops from airplanes had virtually not been investigated by any of the law enforcement agencies in our district. After and uh, the uh, connections that we made almost immediately led to several public officials. And the person whose name came up immediately and most frequently was uh, Dan Harmon. Three years had passed since the boys had been killed, and Jean had no way of knowing that her drug task force was about to be shut down for nearly solving Kevin and Don's murders. It didn't occur to me that it was appropriate for our drug task force to reopen the case of the boys on the track until one of my undercover officers came to me and told me that not only was the case drug related but it was also solvable. He asked permission to investigate and I agreed to that and told him that we would take our information then to Bob Govar. Ironically, Dan Harmon and Richard Garrett, the very same men who had conducted the grand jury investigation of Kevin and Don's murders, were two of the main targets of Govar's drug and corruption investigation. Linda Ives, who for years had believed Harmon and Garrett were sincerely trying to solve her son's murder, now realized they were the ones orchestrating the cover-up. We certainly don't have any suspects at uh, this point in time. It's been quite a while. Uh, 
And, and I, I really didn't anticipate that it would take this long when we first started. I'm frustrated in the amount of time that it's taken. Frustrated that we weren't able to accomplish some things we probably should have been able to. Whatever it comes out of it, if someone's charged or not charged, the, the grand jury has done a tremendous job. But it still will leave the open question, where, uh, if the boys were murdered, who did it? Well, until it's solved, that's correct. To make matters worse, Harmon suddenly became the prosecutor-elect for a three-county district, which included Saline County. Harmon, who had friends in the Arkansas press, wasted no time in launching a massive media smear campaign against Gene Duffy. He immediately began a uh, media crusade against me. Eventually, Gene Duffy's name would be so completely smeared in a public campaign led by Dan Harmon through the media, who printed everything he told them with no evidence, and combined with a statewide subpoena issued for Duffy and her task force's evidence to appear before Judge John Cole, the same judge who appointed Harmon as a special prosecutor of the original grand jury investigation, and who also closed that grand jury without letting the jurors enter their findings into the public record. Well, Duffy was wise and she left the state and became a school teacher in Texas until her name could be later cleared by the FBI. Initially, when leaving, she figured the evidence she gave to Bob Govar and Chuck Banks in their federal investigation would bring indictments to Harmon and others, and her name would be cleared then. Little did she know at the time, though, that U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks would shut down the investigation in June of 1991 and clear Harmon and all officials of any wrongdoing. Meet saline detective John Brown, who enters the story in 1993, and, like Gene Duffy before him, would also be warned off looking into the murders of Kevin and Don. It was now five and a half years since Kevin and Don's murders. Detective John Brown, a 16-year law enforcement veteran, had moved his family into the Saline County area. The Ives family had asked the new sheriff to reopen the case, and John was given the assignment. However, just like Gene Duffy, John's first day on the job included a peculiar request from his boss. My uh, immediate supervisor who was a lieutenant of the Saline County Criminal Investigation Division, took me for a ride that lasted approximately one hour. Um, during this ride to literally nowhere, uh, it appeared the whole purpose was to tell me to leave the case alone. He said things like, there's not anything to this. Um, this could have been an accident. It's going to bring you a lot of grief if you continue on and, and do this. And in, in the end, he finally said, you know, John, you really need to leave this alone. John was disturbed by his superior's attitude, and his concern escalated once he began examining the Ives-Henry case file. It became obvious that uh, once I started going through the case file, it had been robbed of most of the pertinent evidence. Uh, no crime scene photographs. A list of evidence was not present, the things you would expect to find. Here's an FBI document from a later investigation in the mid-1990s showing that there was indeed evidence missing from the case files, which states, quote, evidence from this case to include a sketch of the accident scene, cigarette butts left at the accident site, pictures of the crime scene, plus the original case files are missing, end quote. Also from this FBI document we can see, quote, Saline County officials are baffled that some of the original evidence collected during 1987 is no longer available and that files are missing, end quote. I run across a young lady named Charlene Wilson who told a horror story that I didn't really believe at the time. So I started searching for evidence to substantiate just part of what she had said. Herman went ballistic, he called, he threatened me, he threatened Sheriff Pridgen threatened Captain Gene Donham, the chief deputy. All because I talked to this one woman. To date, a total of nine separate state and federal investigations into MENA have been shut down. The first indication I had that MENA may tie to the death of these two kids was through an audio tape provided to me by Russell Welch, an Arkansas State Police investigator assigned to MENA. The tape was of a confidential informant inside the federal corrections facility. That tape would allege that Don Henry and Kevin Ives were killed because of a connection to Mena, Arkansas. An actual report was generated by Saline County Sheriff's Office in 1987 and in 88 
of people complaining of the planes flying over the tracks at approximately 100 feet above ground level with their lights out at night. I have interviewed five pilots, four of which can verify the A-12 location being the tracks just west of Little Rock, Arkansas, where these two kids' bodies were found. So just like Gene Duffy before him, John Brown was up against a mountain of resistance when it came to the investigation of both Mina and the deaths of Kevin and Don, and was also on the receiving end of threats from Dan Harmon, just like Gene Duffy was, especially when it came to the topic of the deaths of the boys and Charlene Wilson. John Brown would eventually retire from the force after a couple of years from fear of what his investigation uncovered. So let's go back to Dan Harmon, who by June 1990 became the 7th Judicial District Prosecutor elect, and after running Gene Duffy out of town and dealing with Detective John Brown forcing his early retirement, Harmon eventually put his buddy Roger Walls in charge of a new task force, which is the same position once held by Duffy. So you gotta figure this will turn out good, right? Well, no. Dan Harmon's nefarious ways would finally catch up to him in the mid-1990s, and by 1996 he was arrested and by July 1997, he was convicted on several felonies, including drug charges and racketeering. Unfortunately, the investigation was limited to the crimes he committed only after his election to prosecutor in 1990, or somewhere around there. And they were not allowed to look into anything on Harmon from the 1980s, or any of Gene Duffy's or John Brown's investigations into the drain death cases. His buddy Roger Walls would be convicted in January of 1998 on conspiracy charges related to Harmon's case. He was let off a bunch of charges, including drug-related charges, when Bill Clinton appointed U.S. Attorney Paula Casey intervened, but Walls had ultimately received 28 months for conspiracy to extort nonetheless. Harmon and Walls appealed their convictions in 1999 and lost. After getting out of jail, Dan Harmon would again get arrested in connection with drugs in 2010. It is tonight's top story. Police say the six-month investigation that landed Harmon behind bars also led to the arrest of a dozen other people in Grant County. Police say it's a drug operation ranging from cocaine to painkillers. THV's Faith Abube joins us now with more. Faith? Hi, Liz. Police say Harmon was illegally selling prescription drugs near Sheridan School. While there's no evidence linking him and the 12 other suspects, police say they are all part of an ongoing drugs, drug sting. Anybody who sells drugs is a threat to the public. Former Saline County Prosecutor Dan Harmon is back behind bars, barely four years after serving time for extortion, racketeering, and drug conspiracy from a 1997 conviction. You know, if he thinks that he's going to be able to do it because of his status as being a former prosecutor, he's wrong. It's not going to happen here. Harmon is among the last few alleged drug dealers taken off Sheridan Streets after a six month investigation. Harmon lives in Saline County, but the investigation led police here to a traffic stop. Police say they found several drug items in his car. Harmon's passenger, a well-known drug dealer, is also now helping authorities. Anytime you're dealing with narcotics and dealing with this type of criminal element, it can be dangerous and get dangerous at any time. Assistant Chief Brent Cole says the former prosecutor is facing several felony charges that could land him in prison, this time for life. I think it's sad, you know... Uh, the man was a prosecutor. He used to prosecute people for the same crimes that he's committed. Police are now releasing any information or photographs of the 12 other suspects, but they also face serious charges. Cole says for a small community the size of Sheridan, he hopes the sting sends a message to offenders still out there. It don't matter who you are, we're going to come after you. Even though police say Harmon was selling the drugs near school, they don't believe he sold them to any young kids. He's still behind bars tonight on a $100,000 bond, Liz. All right, Faith, thank you. Harmon served one term as Saline County Prosecutor in 1979. Voters elected him again in the 90s for two terms. He resigned after his 1996 arrest. He got out of prison early in 2006 for helping prosecutors in a murder case. So after understanding that Dan Harmon actually is a piece of sh I mean work, and involved heavily in cocaine and marijuana distribution, we can look back at both the investigations of Gene Duffy and John Brown with a fresh eye towards what the actual truth is. And that truth is startling. One of the witnesses in common in both Duffy's and Brown's investigations was Charlene Wilson, who Dan Harmon aggressively tried blocking any contact from her to both Duffy and Brown, though both investigators dealt plenty with Wilson anyways. Duffy even vouches for Wilson in as far as saying that her testimony in the matter is true and accurate. What was it about Wilson that got Harmon so up in anger when investigators into the deaths of the boys would start questioning her? 
First, let's go to Jean Duffy again and get her opinion on Charlene Wilson as a witness to her investigation. Charlene was recommended to our task force as an informant from uh, DEA who had used her as an informant and also from at least two other law enforcement agencies that had used her as an informant and said that she was reliable. I uh, used Charlene and she proved to be very, very reliable. There was not one bit of information that she ever gave me that didn't pan out. So now, let's hear what Charlene Wilson has to say. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle. I do know that the boys were watching the drop site, okay? And they got curious as to what was being dropped there. Well, that's some pretty explosive stuff right there. Wilson admits to being there that night on the tracks. and names Dan Harmon as one of the people being there as well, and also mentions the drug drop as the reason as to why they were being there to begin with. Jean Duffy completely backs her on this. You know what? Wilson's not the only one naming Dan Harmon as being on the tracks that night. Linda Ives turned this witness over to a local investigator who took him to the FBI. The FBI immediately put this witness into protective custody, gave him a polygraph test, which he passed, and opened their investigation. Where we uh, didn't realize there was anybody else out there at first. We were just, like I said, goofing off. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we come up on, or didn't really come up on, we noticed there were people on the track, so a flashlight come on and then go back off. They weren't looking in our direction, but we could see the light. And so we kind of quieted down and snuck up a little bit closer to see what was going on and there was five individuals uh, standing on the tracks. One thing that struck my curiosity is uh, at the time my mother was dating uh, an attorney named Dan, uh, Dan Harmon. I knew him well enough to recognize him. There were uh, two more individuals that uh, a few minutes after we got there uh, were walking down the railroad tracks that had a rifle uh, and what looked to be a flashlight. And, they were more or less kind of minding their own business. Uh, and when they realized someone else was on the tracks, uh, they stopped and was fixing to turn around when someone, uh, or Danny, motioned for them to come closer uh, over to where they were. Uh, they hesitated and eventually ended up uh, walking on towards the rest of the group. While my head was turned, I heard a, what sounded like a gunshot. I saw a flash, as you would expect with a gunshot at night. We were pretty much terrified and bolted and ran. Other witnesses corroborated that evidence. I know that Dan Harmon went down there, because I was down the road from there, sent an automobile. I do know that a drop was made out of uh, absolutely 100% equivocally made there that night. And there you have it. Both witnesses, independently of each other, who don't know each other, who both passed polygraphs, named Dan Harmon as being on the train tracks that night and involved in the murders of the boys. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle, I'd like to point out that Gene Duffy, by 1994, cleared by the FBI of any and all of the charges made up by Dan Harmon and Judge Cole, came back to help the FBI with their investigation into the murders of Kevin and Don, being run by the FBI's Phyllis Cornyn. Here's Gene Duffy again with some hindsight looking back on things in the mid-90s. So in June of 1990, Dan Harmon became the district's prosecutor-elect. The first news conference or news interview that he gave he used the entire interview to uh, begin to discredit me. After working with the FBI for 18 months, beginning in March of 1995, of course now I realize what was the basis for Dan Harmon's viciousness against me and determination that I be uh, not allowed to do my job. I now know that Dan Harmon was on the tracks with 
the boys the night that they were murdered. I look back on the chain of events and realize that I likely caused the shutdown of my own investigation. It's clear to me that the turning point was when I gave Chuck Banks the information uh, developed by my task force that the boys were killed because they had stumbled upon a large shipment of drugs dropped from an airplane. In my heart, I feel that that was a red flag that caused Chuck Banks to close the investigation down before it led to Mina. And that's not all. For nearly 23 years, this confession letter that the Ives and Henry families were told nothing about, written and signed by Charlene Wilson on May 28, 1993, in front of three public officials to bear witness, was left hidden in the original case files. Only just last year in 2015 did a retired police officer friend of Linda Ives manage to find it and get it to her and her lawyer, R. David Lewis. Linda and her friend went to current Saline County Prosecutor Ken Cassidy with the confession letter, and he not only refused to even look at it, he told them to go see the Saline County Sheriff with the matter. Guess who the current Saline County Sheriff is? Rodney Wright, who just so happens to be Dan Harmon's nephew. Can you believe that? So current Saline County Prosecutor Ken Cassidy told Linda Ives and her retired police officer friend to take the Charlene Wilson confession letter that places Dan Harmon on the tracks the night of the murders to Dan Harmon's nephew. It's no wonder the boys' murders have never been officially solved. There's a whole list of former law enforcement members and public officials who were involved in the boys' case over the decades who have gone on to be arrested. In the letter, Wilson confesses to a great many of things, including stabbing one of the boys. So now there's two witnesses in Charlene Wilson and Tom Nyhaus who independently of each other and past polygraphs both identify and place Dan Harmon on the tracks that August night where Kevin and Dom were killed. And there's the confession letter from Charlene Wilson that also places Dan Harmon on the tracks that night and includes her admission that she stabbed one of the boys, likely the stab wound found on Don Henry's back that was found in the second autopsy performed by Dr. Burton. And to further the point, we see Dan Harmon finally getting caught after years of nefarious activities and going to jail for nine years. And within two years of being released, he gets arrested again and yet more drug charges. Could there be more? What else is there? How about this? An FBI file dated February 6, 1995, and in it, it states in part, quote, Further, it appears that the special prosecutor appointed in this case, redacted, says Dan Harmon to that redaction, may have misused his authority and disregarded other leads that may have assisted efforts to bring this investigation to a logical conclusion. Lastly, it also appears that certain Saline County officials may have conspired to cover up the investigation in the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. End quote. Here's an FBI document showing that Dan Harmon himself indeed pushed to be appointed special prosecutor right from the beginning. It states, quote, Little Rock FBI investigation reveals that Benton Chief of Police Rick Elmendorf, Judge John Cole, and Dan Harmon were at Judge Cole's residence when Dan Harmon suggested that he be made special prosecutor for the Ives Henry case. End quote. The document also states, quote, Since the beginning of the investigation by the special prosecutor, the case has become riddled with rumors and innuendos. Special Prosecutor Harmon and Assistant Richard Garrett requested assistance from the Arkansas State Police, yet continuously withheld information from them." End quote. So Harmon and Garrett would ask assistance from the Arkansas State Police, but they would withhold information from them. Which is what someone who was guilty might do if they were trying to find out what other authorities knew about the case, and to keep ahead of any potential damage, as well as not let any information out that might reveal one's true participation in a crime. So there you go. In the mid-1990s, the FBI knew there was a cover-up in the murders of Kevin Ives and Don Henry, and they also knew Dan Harmon was likely involved. As a matter of fact, there's a whole pile of FBI and other government documents that are partially redacted in some form or another relating to the murder of the two boys. We'll get to them in a moment. First, I'm going to try and piece together what happened that night from what we do know about this case, which also includes information from witness testimony given by others that we have not documented in this film yet. We know that Kevin and Don went out around midnight to go hunting. And thanks to Charlene Wilson's confession letter recently unearthed in 2015, we know that her, Dan Harmon, and another individual named Larry Rochelle were going to be at their tracks that night to pick up a drug drop from a plane. Kevin and Don were walking along the tracks and happened to come across Dan Harmon and company on the tracks, as witnessed by a then 12-year-old Tom Nyhouse and his group of friends who were hiding in the nearby bushes watching. 
A shot was fired either by Harmon's group or the boys, and Kevin and Don took off, as did Nyhouse and the group of other kids that witnessed those events. Next, we have two separate witnesses who gave testimony, one being Ronnie Godwin, now deceased, and the other being club owner Mike Crook, who was relaying testimony of what another witness described to him about the following events, and neither knew each other, and both were telling the same story. They were saying that the boys showed up at the ranch at grocery store with another friend of theirs, Keith Coney, and this would be sometime after the first incident on the tracks. And Coney then left on his motorcycle when officers Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell showed up and beat the boys unconscious outside the store, probably killing Kevin right there with the reported rifle butt blow to the skull, which showed up in Dr. Burton's second autopsy. Then Campbell and Lane threw the boys into the car and drove off towards the tracks, where Dan Harmon and the others were waiting, and would eventually place the boys on the tracks. Keith Tony, who may have been with the group of kids in the woods that first saw the incident happen at the tracks, went to the club where Keith McCaskill worked and told him about the incident on the tracks. And McCaskill then went to the tracks himself, which makes sense as well, as Charlene Wilson is named McCaskill as one of the people at the tracks by the time she leaves the car that's parked some distance away and reaches the tracks where Dan Harmon, Danny Allen, Keith McCaskill, and others are alleged to be. Wilson doesn't mention Campbell and Lane as being on the tracks in the confession letter, and it's possible that they were first tasked to find the boys after they took off from the tracks, and when Campbell and Lane found them at the ranch at grocery store, and after beating them unconscious, they perhaps brought them back to the tracks where Harmon and the others were waiting, and they themselves left the scene, leaving Harmon and the others to place the boys on the tracks for the upcoming train. Also of note, as mentioned earlier, is that Keith Coney would soon be killed as well, one of the number of witnesses killed in the months and years following the murders of Kevin and Don. Here's Keith Coney's mother describing that her son knew there were two attackers that killed Kevin and Don, allegedly Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane as testified to by Ronnie Godwin and Mike Crook, and saying that her son Keith, like Keith McCaskill later would be, was afraid for his life. He was fearing for his life, you know, a couple of months before. He said a couple of times that he knew people, that he was being watched and he was afraid. Mrs. Alexander says her son knew the two teenagers run over by the train, and she says he indicated to her he had been there when the boys had died, that he spotted two attackers. But he knew there was two there. I did try to get him to tell me who, and he, he was either afraid or didn't know. In the movie Obstruction of Justice, which many of these clips are taken from, they present a list of names of people who are suspects and implicated in the murders and cover-up of Kevin and Don. As a result, officers Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane sued filmmaker Pat Matriciana for libel and lost their case on appeal. The interesting part about that case is that Campbell and Lane were required to prove that Matriciana was wrong in naming them as suspects by showing there was no public references to them as being involved in the murders. Campbell and Lane instead set out to prove that they had nothing to do with and were innocent in the murders. The court sided with Matriciana and that there were in fact numerous public sources that had stated Campbell and Lane were somehow involved in the train deaths, and Matriciana had not just made it up unfounded. That was the point of the suit, and the fact that Campbell and Lane instead tried to prove their innocence, and the court still didn't rule in their favor certainly says a few more things in my opinion. That makes it two witnesses naming and describing Campbell and Lane as beating the boys unconscious and throwing them in the cars, and another witness in Keith Tony that says he was there when the two boys were killed and it was two men that did it. Charlene Wilson doesn't mention Campbell and Lane in her confession letter, but she does say she spent the first portion of time that night back at the car at the road, a dirt road, a distance away, before coming up to the tracks herself. It's entirely possible and very plausible that Campbell and Lane dropped off Kevin and Don to Dan Harmon and company and then left. Wilson's confession letter is hard to read and very incoherent, but she does say she was high on cocaine and meth that night, which kind of explains the way she describes the night's events. When Charlene Wilson eventually does make her way to the tracks, according to her confession letter, the boys are already there and, in her written words, deceased. And she states that Dan Harmon and company goad her into stopping one of the boys, which was probably Don Henry. According to the FBI, law enforcement officials were indeed involved in the murders and cover-up of Kevin and Don. From this document, we can see that the, quote, Investigation has revealed that law enforcement officials in the Little Rock area may have been involved in the captioned homicide, end quote. Here's a list of suspected officials we're not allowed to know about. It says, quote, Law enforcement officials alleged to be involved in drug trafficking in Saline County include, end quote. That's a big list, all redacted. 
How can it be that so many officials have been corrupted over such a long period of time? Remember how the current saline sheriff, Rodney Wright, just so happens to be Dan Harmon's nephew? So what about the sheriff before him? Well, in 2012, then Saline County Sheriff Bruce Pennington said the case remained open, and the investigation is continuing. From the same article in the Saline Courier, it says that Detective Mike Frost is the only one assigned to the case. Here's Detective Mike Frost, who was the lone officer assigned to Kevin and Don's case back in 2012. August 3rd, 1987, and a horrific discovery right on the border of Alexander and Saline County. Anytime you're dealing with a homicide that has any type of drug ties to it, you always run into those problems where you got a lot of different stories. A train traveling 50 miles an hour, the conductor sees something in the track just ahead. Unable to stop, the train runs over two people covered by a tarp. 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry drag nearly a mile. The first autopsy deems it a suicide. Their bodies exhume one year later. The case turns to a homicide. We have several people that said they were in the woods. We have no one that has said that they were at the scene. Lieutenant Mike Frost, head of Saline County's criminal investigation division now leads the investigation. There are not a whole lot of leads, uh, new leads that come in. I do not have a detective assigned to the case. I'm the one who goes through the case. I've been through the case files and try to follow up on things that I can find in the case file from that time frame. Lieutenant Frost says the case has been met with numerous challenges. He says the biggest perhaps speculation. It really makes it difficult to get a handle on exactly what happened on the case. On top of speculation are claims of a government cover-up. No, there has not been, as long as I've been in the sheriff's office, or have been in the criminal investigation division. Some suggest the boys saw an aircraft drop of money and drugs tied to an alleged drug ring based out of MENA involving government officials. There is nothing that I can see that has tied MENA to uh, this case, that's not saying that it wasn't. Lieutenant Frost says witnesses withhold information out of fear for their lives. Key evidence, crucial, like crime scene pictures and the entire grand jury testimony, all missing from the file. Also, he says several potential witnesses are now deceased. So many of the people who were uh, as witnesses have since passed. And like I said, uh, like we can say, a lot of people were murdered, which they may have been. They're all up people who died of natural causes. But Lieutenant Frost maintains the case is solvable. It just takes finding the right person with the right information. When I know of one individual that I would love to be able to talk to that has been missing for many years, that very well may be tied into it. But he has never been found. Daniel Wilkerson for today's THV. So Mike Frost says they have no one who says they were at the scene. And I can only imagine he's using a play on words as witness Tom Nyhaus, who saw Kevin and Don at the tracks at the same time as Dan Harmon, has stated such, but sadly is now deceased, like so many others in this case. But Charlene Wilson is still alive. She also says she was at the scene. She even wrote and signed a confession letter to that effect. Both Nyhaus and Wilson's testimony contradict what Detective Mike Frost is saying. Frost also says he's gone through the case files, so how did he miss Charlene Wilson's confession letter? While I cannot definitively answer that question, we can see a pattern in what follows in his own arrest and conviction along with his boss and former saline sheriff at the time, Bruce Pennington. So the guys investigating in 2012 end up going to jail themselves, which only shows how much effort they probably put in towards trying to solve the case. So it should be asked again, how can it be that so many officials have been corrupted over such a long period of time? I've found that the deeper you look into the politics of Arkansas in general, you end up coming back having more questions than answers. Former and now deceased, I believe as well, Officer Danny Allen of the Saline County Sheriff's Office, from what I can gather, is allegedly one of the people that was at the tracks that night at some point. Here's an FBI document talking about Allen's polygraph results. Quote, Allen, which is redacted, indicated strong deception regarding knowledge of who killed the boys as well as who put the boys on the tracks." End quote. That statement right there makes perfect sense, and why I say it's key to understanding part of what happened that night, and understanding that it was two different parties involved in the murders of Kevin and Don. Alan not only know who killed the boys, but also who put them on the tracks. It's right there in the wording that Alan knew who killed them, and quote, as well as, end quote who put them on the tracks. Had it have only been a single person or one party doing the deed, the statement would have read something like, 
Quote, Allen indicated strong deception regarding knowledge of who killed and put the boys on the drugs. End quote. That would have indicated only one party or person involved. The fact that the FBI stated that Allen's polygraph indicated strong deception and he knew who killed the boys as well as who put them on the tracks is very direct and indicative of at least two different and separate parties involved. And that makes perfect sense when you consider the two different witnesses stating that Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane beat the boys unconscious at the grocery store and threw them into the back of the unmarked cruiser and drove off towards the tracks. Also in the statement it says, quote, Redacted did advise Special Agent Redacted that he believes, and I'm going to speculate here that the redacted name that is under that long blocked out line says Special Prosecutor Dan Harmon, to be involved in the death of the boys, end quote. Of course, that part is speculative, but I feel safe in that presumption. Here's an Arkansas State Police document detailing Mike Crook's statement about Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane, who, quote, beat the boys unconscious and threw them into the back of the car and then drove off, end quote which is the same story corroborated by another witness, Ronnie Godwin. Also of note in that report is, quote, Crook states that before Keith McCaskill was killed, McCaskill told him that Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell of the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office were following him around, and he was afraid they were going to kill him, end quote. Stuff he told his friends and family as well. And McCaskill was indeed murdered, stabbed over a hundred times in his garage with blood all over the scene reminiscent of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Most of his flesh had been shredded from his arm in his apparent fight to stave off his attackers. By all accounts, McCaskill was a big man and had a reputation as a guy who could handle himself in rough situations with no problems. His murder was pinned on McCaskill's neighbor, a 140-pound 19-year-old kid named Ronald Shane Smith with an IQ of 81. McCaskill was killed in his garage on November 10, 1988, which was a month before the grand jury into Kevin and Don's murders would be closed down. McCaskill was found by his friends the same day of his murder, and while the police were investigating, Shane Smith's father, Ronald Smith, walked over and told the police that his son Shane had witnessed the murder. Apparently, Shane Smith saw several men enter McCaskill's garage, and he went over and was jumped by them, who allegedly stabbed his hand and told him to keep quiet. They allegedly handed Smith a silver tray with a paper bag containing videotapes and told him to leave, and Smith alleges he slipped and fell on blood as he left. Smith states that he had blood on his clothes from that and that he put them in a bag and threw them into the river. The police searched the river and found the bag of clothes and also found the bag of tapes and silver tray on the Smith family residence next door to McCaskill's. Smith's story changed from one of three men entering McCaskill's garage wearing clown masks to five men entering the garage wearing black masks. At his trial, Smith's explanation for the variances in his account, he said, was because he was scared and confused. I'm not sure how or why they convicted Smith, but he did appeal his case on several counts a couple of times, and I won't go into it all here, but you can pause and read it for yourself if you like. But I would like to point out that we also have some familiar figures in this case as well, and Judge John Cole, Richard Garrett, and Femi Malik again. So right off the bat, that should sound some alarm bells about this case. But again, in looking back to Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane, from the ID Files website, an excellent website done by Linda Ives and Gene Duffy, we can see that there was an Arkansas State Police report interview with Joseph Clark Farmer, who was a friend of Eugene Coney, Keith Coney's father. And remember, Keith Coney is the boy that was with Kevin and Don the night they were murdered, and would himself be killed not too long after. And he claimed he saw it was two men that killed Kevin and Don, but that's all he would tell his mother. So according to the State Police interview with Joseph Farmer, Eugene Coney told him, quote, Keith said that the cops killed the boys, end quote. So apparently Keith Coney, who wouldn't, or couldn't, identify the two men he saw kill Kevin and Don to his mother, told his father, Eugene Coney, that it was the police that killed them, which fits in with the story that witness Ronnie Godwin was saying, which was the same story being told by Mike Crook's account of another witness who doesn't know Godwin. Just a quick note about the ID Files website. The URL is www.idfiles.com. The I is for Ives and the D is for Duffy. It's chock full of information about the case, but seems to have stopped being updated in the late 1990s. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but in 1998, the webmaster who was running the site for Linda Ives and Gene Duffy started getting death threats from Thailand, of all places. Of course, people in Thailand didn't likely care about the truth of what happened to two young boys 11 years earlier in Saline County, Arkansas. It's more likely that the death threats were sent via proxy server, or whatever version of one was back in 1998 that was routed through Thailand. At any rate, with the amount of people involved in this case that have been killed, perhaps this is why the site stopped updating? 
I don't know. Remember when I said earlier about the unreal is only just beginning? Do you believe me now? As I said before, there are a whole host of documents from many of the government's alphabet agencies, such as the FBI, CIA, DEA, and so on, pertaining to the murder of Kevin and Don. All the conclusions point to the conspiracy by law enforcement officials to cover it all up, which is exactly what has happened ever since. It's a pretty incredible read when you put it all together. The end result of the FBI investigation in the mid-1990s was for the FBI to inform Linda Ives that, quote, a crime has not been committed, quote. What? After all that, they tell her no crime has been committed? What happened was that when the FBI's Phyllis Cornyn's mid-1990s investigation into Kevin and Don's murders started to point towards the clandestine operations at Mina Airport as to the reason why they were killed, her investigation, like the many investigations before it, was brought to a halt, and that's where it was left. As we can see, as no one right on up to Sheriff Bruce Pennington and Detective Mike Frost, and current Prosecutor Ken Cassidy and Sheriff Rodney Wright, have not done anything to bring this case to justice. No justice for Kevin and Don. Let's hear from Linda Ives. There aren't any words in the English language that can describe how it makes you feel as a parent or as a citizen of Arkansas uh, to see what our officials um, are capable of doing. Um, you know, I think we were just kind of uh, naive, um, common, ordinary people. Got up and went to work every day and came home and went to bed uh, and assumed that everybody else did the same thing and tried to do what was right. And uh, I think Kevin's death has been uh, the rudest awakening that anybody could ever have uh, to see what really goes on and to see what's important to elected and public officials. This is not a political issue with me. Um, we were never a political family. Uh, our lives revolved around the ball field and going to the lake uh, and all of the things that a family does uh, until the Arkansas political machine reached into our lives and destroyed the tranquility that we had. And uh, I want the American people to know that we have to stand up against this kind of corruption and we have to hold our officials accountable and make them work for us instead of against us. In my experience, I believe what is happening here in Arkansas is only a small sample as to what is happening nationwide and I believe that all of America has to stand up and rescue the American system of justice. Rescue the American system of justice indeed. Kevin's mother, Linda Ives, is the whole reason we know so much about this case. She knew right from day one that something was not right, and authorities are not doing what they should have been doing. It's because of her relentless pursuit of the truth that we have so many documents, news articles, television shows, movies, books, and so on, that document the injustice brought upon not only hers and the Henry families, but the many other families who have lost loved ones in the cover-up of the murders of Kevin and Don. I'm the same age as Kevin would have been, and his mother Linda's tenacity and dedication reminds me of my own mother's love and dedication, and if it had been me in Kevin's place all those years ago, I know my own mom would have put up the same fight with the same determination that Linda Ives has had the strength to do in the decades since Kevin's murder. This is a big part of what drove me to do this. Linda Ives made a promise to Kevin that day that she would fight until the killers were brought to justice. Not that it would have mattered, but keep in mind that when she began the fight for justice, she had no idea that it would be a fight against official agencies that are meant to protect us. But Linda Ives has made good on her word and kept the fight for justice alive for Kevin and Don. Now we're going to have a look at where Linda Ives' fight stands today. On August 24, 2016, Linda Ives has sued the U.S. government's various agencies for violating the Freedom of Information Act with regards to withheld and redacted documents that might help bring resolution to her cause. The U.S. agencies named in the lawsuit are a who's who of the alphabet agencies that exist, including the CIA, the DEA, the DOJ, and so on, right down to the local Saline County area agencies. I have to ask, if, in the words of the FBI to Linda Ives, there was no crime committed, then why are there so many agencies storing documents on the case that are classified, redacted, or otherwise deemed a threat to national security if released? Also, why is it still a fight to get these documents for Linda? It's been 29 long and painful years for the Ives and Henry families, as well as the other families who have lost loved ones over all of this. 
Why is the withholding of documents dragging on in a style reminiscent of the Kennedy assassination? At any rate, Linda Ives' current fight is to get proper custody of all the files involving the investigation of her son and get them in full, unredacted form, which she has every right to have, especially by now. In another twist to the story, and the amount of twists and coincidences, whatever you want to call it, goes far beyond the realm of what some conventional wisdom would suggest. Anyways, in this case, just this past September 06, 2016, the judge assigned to Linda Ives' lawsuit has recused himself from the case. Recused meaning he has stepped down from the case citing a reason. That reason, it turns out, and quite the coincidence for sure, is that Judge Leon Holmes is related to Linda Ives. He's her sixth cousin. Apparently they even see each other at family reunions. The sad part, though this is just speculation, Judge Holmes might have been one of the good guys in this story and perhaps may have been someone who might have been able to help Linda out. His actions of recusal show his honesty anyways. Let's hope Linda Ives' case gets turned to another judge who is equally as honest, but doesn't happen to be Linda's seventh niece removed from her neighbor's side or something like that. One thing to remember, Linda Ives isn't taking the U.S. government to court over the murder case itself. She is suing for the release of information related to the case, which she is legally entitled to, which will eventually help her finally bring the case to court and maybe, just maybe, get some justice for once and for all. If anyone deserves it, Linda Ives does. Remember that it was only just last year when Linda Ives got Charlene Wilson's confession letter and went to current Saline County Prosecutor Ken Cassidy, and he referred her to Dan Harmon's nephew, Rodney Wright, who is the current Saline Sheriff. Well, Rodney Wright told Linda that he had tried to contact Charlene Wilson, but would need a warrant from Ken Cassidy for her arrest. Cassidy, meanwhile, says it's not his job to issue a warrant, and it's probably not, but do you think he would offer to point Linda in the right direction as to who might just issue a warrant? Well, you can use your imagination to answer that question, and you'd probably be correct. Cassidy did, however, tell Linda Ives that he would pass off the case to the Arkansas State Police, but it would be up to them if they wanted to take the case or not. Let's also not forget that the Arkansas State Police also happens to be one of the agencies that has been involved in withholding information that may have solved this case decades ago. It's so sad and shocking when you think about it all. I mean, where does one turn to for help? Do you turn to more officials? Look what happened when Linda Ives did just that last year in 2015. So many officials are corrupt it's beyond ridiculous. How do you know which ones to trust? Here's what happened to a few more officials involved in the case over the years. Remember Bob Govar, assistant to Chuck Banks who closed down the investigation and cleared Dan Harmon of any wrongdoing in 1991? He eventually hooked up with Jay Campbell over the years and they were involved together in crimes using Act 309 prison laborers to clear a lot for Govar's new home which Govar got away with by saying he didn't know Campbell was using Act 309 prisoners, which are prisoners held in local jails waiting transfer to state prisons and are not allowed to be used for labor. Also, Jane Campbell and his wife Kelly would end up getting severe jail sentences for a variety of charges, none of which had anything to do with Kevin and Don's case. But Jay Campbell originally got 40 years in 2007 before the court threw out his convictions in 2009, but then he pleaded guilty to four felonies and was sentenced to 15 years in prison in 2010. They brought Judge John Cole out of retirement for the original trial as well. Go figure. There's not enough judges? We need to bring him out of retirement? It seems pretty sketchy to me. No wonder they threw Campbell's original conviction out. There's a shady history between Judge John Cole, Dan Harmon, and Jay Campbell that has never really been brought to light. How about Richard Garrett, remember? He was Dan Harmon's assistant for many years, including through the original grand jury investigation into Kevin and Don's murders. Well, a few years back, his house was foreclosed on by the bank and eventually sold. The new owner had just moved from out of state and he didn't know the history of Don and Kevin, nor the previous owner of the house, Richard Garrett. After some time while doing renovations in the basement, the house's new owner discovered a false wall, and in behind it was a drug lab. So Richard Garrett had a drug lab in his house all these years, how about that? And get this, the new house owner called the police and an officer came over and advised him to take everything to the dump. When the new house owner suggested that he didn't want to take the chance in case he got pulled over on the way there, he would have all the drug lab equipment in his car. The officer told him not to worry and that he would escort the new house owner to the dump, which is what they did. It wasn't until later that the new house owner started to learn the backstory of who Richard Garrett was and who Kevin and Don were, that he realized the officer who had escorted him to the dump was more interested in destroying the evidence than to go after Garrett, which is what should have been done to begin with. Hard to blame the new house owner though at the time, as he was following the directions of the police and didn't know the history. And once he found out, he went on the radio and told a story 
which for those who do know the history, do not find it surprising in the least. But who to go to is indeed a difficult question to answer. Surely there has to be some honest official somewhere that would do something if they knew all the known facts. Just on the basics of it, there is the immediate investigation not done properly by officials at the scene, even leaving behind Kevin's foot. There's Fami Malik's ridiculous ruling that Kevin and Don smoked too much pot to be awoken by a freight train bearing down on them, with not only the horn blasting away, but also the hundreds of tons of screeching steel as the brakes were being heavily applied in a futile attempt to stop. Revelations surface about many of Malik's other controversial rulings, but he still gets supported at the highest levels of state government. A second autopsy done by out-of-town pathologists reveals that Kevin and Don were killed before their bodies were placed on the tracks. Dan Harmon along with Rick Elmendorf convinced Judge John Cole to appoint Harmon to be special prosecutor in the grand jury set up to investigate the deaths of Kevin and Don. Witnesses to the murder start getting killed before the grand jury is complete. Judge John Cole along with Harmon and his assistant Richard Garrett brought the grand jury investigation into Kevin and Don's murders to a halt without letting the jury members enter their report for the record. Witnesses continue to keep getting killed. In 1990, a drug task force led by Gene Duffy starts finding out that local officials are not only involved in the drug trade, but also involved in the murders of Kevin and Don in the subsequent cover-up. A federal investigation into corruption, drugs, etc. of Arkansas local and state officials was being headed up by Chuck Banks and his assistant Bob Gover at the same time as Duffy's task force was making its discoveries and Duffy would later give Banks and go over all of her evidence to which Banks responded by closing down the federal investigation and clearing all officials including Dan Harmon of any and all criminal activity. Gene Duffy would get run out of state by Harmon in a vicious smear campaign with the compliance and assistance of the local and state press. In 1993, Detective John Brown starts investigating and finding out the same things as Gene Duffy and like Duffy, was threatened and harassed by Harmon to the point that Brown resigned from the force out of fear. Charlene Wilson would make stunning and documented revelations that not only was she at the tracks with Kevin and Don the night the boys were killed, but so was Dan Harmon. Also in 1993, Wilson signs a confession letter of her own experiences to the event that night, including admitting to stabbing one of the boys in the back, something evidenced by Dr. Burton's second autopsy. Wilson's letter remains hidden for the next 22 years. Another witness who also passed the polygraph, Tom Nyhouse, also witnessed Dan Harmon on the tracks the night the boys were killed and also places Dan Harmon there with Kevin and Don at one point, with a shot being fired and the boys taken off into the woods. Then there's the two witnesses that say they saw two men beating the boys at the grocery store and throwing them into the back of the car and driving off to the tracks. One of the men is identified as Kirk Lane according to one of the witnesses. A third witness, who was also later killed, told his mother before he was killed that he saw two men kill Kevin and Don, which corroborates what the other two witnesses said. The FBI gets involved in 1994 and despite all their own documentation showing indeed that there was murders, drug distribution activity and a cover up of the murders of Kevin and Don by officials, they ultimately decide there were no crimes committed. By 1996 Dan Harmon would finally be caught for his drug dealing and other nefarious activities and would be convicted and sent to jail for 9 years in 1997 and then would be charged again with drug offenses a few years after his release. But despite this, no one will investigate any of his earlier crimes as discovered by Gene Duffy's task force or Detective John Brown's investigations. Over the years, witnesses continue to die. Officials continue to get caught for their corrupt ways and some are jailed. Others are more protected. Finally, Linda Ives and her lawyer get Charlene Wilson's confession letter that they did not even know existed. They take the letter to the state prosecutor, Ken Cassidy, tells them to go to the sheriff, who just happens to be Dan Harmon's nephew. All of that is just sort of the overview of the story, without all the finer details and the many other players involved. I cannot even begin to fathom how the Ives and Henry families have had to process all of this and try to live normal lives that is the so-called American dream. I'm not a judge or a jury, but when you consider just the witnesses saying that Dan Harmon was on the tracks that night with the boys, and one of those witnesses even writes a confession letter stating that she stabbed one of the boys, which corresponds with pathologist Dr. Burton's findings on the second autopsy, it seems a pretty safe bet to me to say that Dan Harmon and Charlene Wilson should be brought in for the murders of Kevin Eyes and Don Henry. Others should be brought in as well, the ones that are still alive anyways. People such as Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane perhaps? If you really want to help Linda Ives, the Ives and Henry families, and the other families affected by this finally see some justice done, I suggest you email your congressman. It doesn't matter what state you're in, the more they keep hearing about it from everyday regular people, the more chance there is that someone out there in the halls of the legislative branch, or perhaps even the judicial branch, might take up the case and help to finally resolve it. 
Also, please, by all means, copy and share this video as much as you want and can. The more people that are aware of this case, the more it becomes likely that something will get done about it. As noted earlier, the murders of Kevin and Don were a national story in the 1990s for a while, and it's likely that there are literally millions of people who watched the Unsolved Mysteries back then and have forgotten about the case, and would be totally shocked at the current updates and outcome if reminded. So like I say, copy it, share it, spread it around, make sure people don't forget that two teenage boys were murdered and not allowed the chance to grow up. Others were killed to keep the cover-up going. Families were devastated and destroyed, and it was all swept under the rug by various U.S. government agencies. Also, if you feel like you really want to do more to help out, here's a GoFundMe page set up to help Linda Ives out with the current lawsuit to get all those records and documents released into her custody. The Ives and Henry parents are retired now, and Linda Ives and her family just do not have the resources to continue this battle alone, so any and all help is so much very appreciated. And you can take it to heart that your donation will go towards the cause of helping get justice for Kevin Ives and Don Henry, and finally some closure for the families. I'm going to sign off for now, and I apologize for the unevenness of this film, and some of the quality. I'm not a filmmaker, and I'm certainly no Steven Spielberg, but it's my first film, and my main hope is to help more people understand what happened. There's so much more I left out, but I just wanted to stay with the main parts of what happened to Kevin and Don, and Kevin's mother Linda, and her fight to get justice for their sons. I'll leave off with the song from metal band Metallica, who released their fourth full-length album titled Injustice for All on August 25th, 1988, a year and two days after Kevin and Don were killed, and before Judge Cole along with Dan Harmon and Richard Garrett would shut down the original grand jury investigation. The song is called Injustice for All, and the lyrics are very prophetic and fitting in this case, and still relevant today. So like I said earlier, please share this video and help make more people aware. For Kevin and Don.